Good morning. Welcome to the Drive to School podcast. I am again, uh, Pastor Harrison Goodman. I'm the content executive for Higher Things. And joining me today is Pastor Chris Hall from Zion Lutheran Church. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we have you here, uh, Pastor, to uh, mix your ADD with my ADD, uh, but also... To, to tell me stories. Uh, you do the you do the history stuff real well. Um, and it's it's an important thing, church history. Uh, but but not just because we we like to memorize dates and, and sound real smart, but because really uh it, it's the, the same kind of problems that keep on happening over and over again. And so as we sort of walk with the saints of old through the problems that they had, uh not only do we find the hope that they had in Christ our risen Lord, but we also we also are given uh, sort of the tools to to deal with the stuff that's going on around us. So um do you want to talk a little bit about church history and then uh where we're going to go today sounds like a plan so i mean church history it, like you said it's more than just memorizing um facts it's more than just okay this is when this guy was born this guy died this woman was born this woman died these are there are people that christ died on the cross for rose from the dead for that they may have eternal life and that's really the focal point of all history History isn't just starting day one, leading up to the last day, and random stuff happening. All of history finds its culmination in the, the incarnation, life, sufferings, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus the Christ. That's everything. It all centers around Christ. He defines every moment of history. So every moment is defined by our relationship with Christ. And you see this in the early church. So what I wanted to talk a little bit about today to start explaining that, how all of history is our relationship with Christ, his relationship with us is not just the early church, like first century, but looking at the church right toward the end of her time of persecution. Um, it's interesting right now in the world. A lot of people say the church is persecuted. We're going like you have a couple years ago when because of COVID, you had shutdowns for churches. And everyone said, oh, this is the most, I heard one person say, this is the most persecuted we've ever been. I'm like, well, let's look real quick. I don't think so, you know? And I mentioned this guy named Diocletian. Diocletian, he was a Roman emperor and he hated the uh, Christians. And it's funny with Romans, Romans, they were religious people. They weren't atheists. They weren't people that denied these. They loved gods. They would always take a religion and say, does this make us more powerful? So they adopted the Greek gods because before them, that was the great empire, Alexander the Great and people like that. And you had this great power. So they took the Greek gods, gave them new names. So they loved it. They were a very religious people. And in comes people that preach and live contrary to their religion. People that preach, hey, this life, we're just treasures and jars of clay. This life is transient. There is a greater life. And the great thing about this life is weakness. Our God died, not some stupendous death, but a weak death. He died on a cross like a common criminal. To the Romans, this is crazy. So Christians living out their faith completely dashed to pieces the Roman lifestyle. Some emperors, they would kind of persecute Christians, but toward the end, I'm talking early fourth century, late third century, they were just going after them, feeding them to lions, crucifying them, burning them. One of my favorite martyrs is St. Lawrence. He was actually burned alive and on a spit. So, you know, they put him on there, they turn him around. Like a chicken. And when he was cooked store. on one side, exactly. It's like you're at Costco, but it smells bad. Well, Costco, basically. Um, but the thing is, you know, <laughs> You know, well, now we're going to be shut down. Podcast over at Bash Costco. Uh, <laughs> you know, but St. Lawrence, when he was cooked on one side, he said, turn me over for I am done here and I must be fully cooked for God. I mean, this reality, that joy of, hey, you can burn me all you want. I'm still going to a better place. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And that's where St. Lawrence is going. So you have all the way up to basically the reign of a guy named Constantine. You have Christians are persecuted from Christ to Stephen, St. Perpetua, and Felicitas, to female martyrs. There are a lot more female martyrs. You had, like I said, St. Lawrence earlier, Origen, all these guys, they're killed for the faith. And then Constantine, he kind of sees the writing on the wall a little bit, and he realizes we can't keep this up. 
So in 313, they came out with something called the Edict of Milan, Milan, darling, the Edict of Toleration. And it was basically, you can't kill someone just because they're a Christian anymore. And this is really one of the most monumental dates in all of history, because prior to that, being a Christian was hard. To be a Christian, you had to really put your money where your mouth is. Going to church was a life or death situation. You didn't put on the back of your, your car or your chariot in those days, member of you know Zion Lutheran Church for 32 years. <laughs> they, they catch you and cook you. It didn't happen. The magnitude of but that after is the, insane. Right. I, I mean, you think about that. Like we, we talk now about whether or not you can put a nativity scene outside of your small business. But that the right. law, that the big, big law was, I guess we can't kill you now. That, yeah. that speaks to when we talk about persecution a little bit. I mean, and that's the thing. It's like it, it, if you were a Christian, you really meant it. It was that you you read James, faith without debt works is dead. You're like, OK. And, you know, it wasn't something to really contemplate. But with 313, that changes everything. It's, it's almost popular to be a Christian now. In fact, the emperor, he's hanging out with a guy. But the problem is they're still very religious. And even these people becoming Christians are very religious, but they're not the right Christianity. And that's why every time we talk about 313, the Edict of Milan, we have to talk about 325, the Council of Nicaea. And why we talk about that is that's where it all came to a head on what does it mean to be a Christian? And we confess it every Sunday, right? I mean, most Sundays, you confess the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed or the Athanasian Creed. Creed is just Greek or Latin for I believe. So at Council of Nicaea 325, you have everyone come together. What do we believe? And there's two, two main guys, a bunch of guys there, actually. Um, you have Athanasius, who's there, who later became Bishop of Alexandria. At that time, the leader of the Catholics, as they were called, was a guy named Alexander of Alexandria. It's kind of boring uh, names there. And then you had the opposition, this guy named Arius. Not Arian, like Hitler stuff, not that. But it's Arius. Still bad. Still bad. He's still bad. Arius, he had a statement where he said, there was a time when the son of God was not. Meaning that the son of God is a creature. Now you hear this like, wait a minute. John 1, 1 says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm quoting the scripture that that Jesus was God. That, that means that he is the alpha and the omega, the same yesterday, today and forever. There was yeah. no time when he was not. Exactly. Now, Arius would say, OK, fine. I believe that, too. But he's not as big a God as the father. is. The father is God, God. And the son is like a creature that he gave God like divine attributes to. Constantine went along with Arius. He's the emperor. So a lot of people went along with him, Athanasius, Alexander, and then my favorite saint, St. Nicholas of Myrna. He was the guy that we all know, you know, gave coins to the children and everything, supposedly punched Arius at the Council of Nicaea. And a lot of historians say that never happened. It's not real. Like it happened. I know it happened. I'd Even like if it did, it did, it's kind of like a Quentin Tarantino version of it. You know, if he directed the Council it. of Nicaea, you know, would have gone with it. But no, you have these faithful men. And they defended the faith. And the faith is what we now have in the Nicene Creed. And we say of the same substance with the Father by whom all things were made. So this is what's happening here is all of this history is in relation to Christ. How is Christ related to us? How are we related to Christ? Prior to 313, I know I'm with Christ. He is the son of God. I'm going to give my life for him, even if they come to take it. 313 happens. You can actually have like armchair Christians. You know, I have time to sit and think about it now. I have time to sit and, oh, this Arius guy, what he's saying makes sense. It sounds nice. Well, no. Athanasius ended up confessing the faith and he was exiled five times for it. He wrote a great book called On the Incarnation, Defending the Truth. So the question is, what can we learn from this history? Is the world will always hate the truth. Look, even after 313, yes, Christianity is legal now, but now it's no 
no longer attacked with swords and spear and crosses and lions. Now they come after the theology. They critique that. They poke holes in it. And the same thing still happens today. The devil's never satisfied with a good church. He always tries to destroy it. And that's his part in this great play. And that's so, what you see here from persecution on to Nicaea. It kind of seems to me that uh, as, as most Christians today talk about persecution, what they really mean is we're not popular anymore. Uh, because like right. you, you compare, uh, well, not having the, the moral majority or whatever you want to sort of grab for the vocabulary for it with, they lit me on fire. Um, yeah. I, I see which one's actual persecution, but at the same time, maybe there's a gift to that, that um, the, mm -hmm. the church that was popular was also the church where all the heresy started popping up that their popular church is not necessarily a faithful church and it's it's not just that like we understand so much better but when you start to to grab hold of these things that are well, false doctrine what you're ending with every single time is less comfort in christ every single time yeah. we sort of just lean on these things because they are frivolous because they are new because they are trendy or popular uh what you end up with is less hope for the forgiveness of sins because here's the thing what does it mean if jesus isn't actually god well then a creature died for you but a creature is just like anything else the cost god of the chicken himself, died for me and that tasted good for a yeah, little bit but it satisfies for an forgiveness hour. of sins i don't know the only one who can make satisfaction is god himself and that's the reality god laid down his life in this personal union on the cross god and man in one in christ jesus that God is satisfying himself. He is making the his sacrifice there that we may have salvation. Because what happens with creatures, the thing with creatures are we are fallen, we're sinful, we're corrupt. A corrupt sacrifice does not make satisfaction for us. Because Christ is perfect, he takes all of my sin. He has room for all of my sin. So he takes all of it, therefore I'm forgiven of all of them. And that's what's really at stake with guys like Athanasius and Alexander and Nicholas. And as the decades and centuries go on, comforting the terrified and the reality that they are absolutely forgiven by Christ, absolutely loved by the Father. And that's what all of history leads up to. That's what it all flows from, is the reality of who God is for you. And that's the thing. So, so when you study history in school, it's, it's neat stuff, you know? Revolutionary War, Civil War, World War II. But we see it as a different thing. What is this telling us about Christ and his relationship to us? I like it. So can I ask you to, uh, as we kind of wrap things up for the day, maybe we'll put a bow on it this way. Um, if you could channel your favorite saint, if you could somehow speak for a heretic punching Santa, um, who is speaking to a, a, a kid today who just felt like, man, we're just we're about the only ones left and it's getting harder and harder to be a Christian. What would heretic punching Santa say? Take heart. It's going to be okay. Take heart because Jesus has done it all for you. He's paid the price already. The punishment's been had. The hard time is over. He's faced the greater war force, but it means you're still going to fight. You're still going to have the suffering. The devil hates your guts because Jesus loves you. The world doesn't understand you because Jesus loves you. You're going to hate yourself sometimes because Jesus loves you. But worry not. He does love you. He sent me here to tell you that, to remind you of that. You don't have to go to some grand assembly hall to get it. It's right here, right in front of you. For what does Jesus say? Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. It's going to be hard going ahead, but we're doing it bearing the cross together because Christ has borne the ultimate cross for us. Thanks be to God for that. Amen. I love it. Well, thanks so much. I can't top that. So we're going to call it a day right ah. here. Thanks so much for joining us, Pastor Hall. Thanks for having and, uh, me. We'll see you next time. We'll tell us another story. All right. Fun times.